Welcome to episode nine of Dial the Gate. My name is, you think one of these days I'll get my, the name of my show right, Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Welcome, everyone. I see we already have a hundred and over 100 uh, viewers uh, live with us. If you're joining us later on, welcome as well. Thank you for, thank you for stopping by. You know him as Chevron Guy. You know him as Chevron 1 encoded, all the way up to 7, and sometimes 8, depending on which galaxy we're dealing with. Mr. Gary Jones, we're going to bring him in here in just a moment. But before I do that, I would like to invite you to share the show with your friends. If you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal to me if you click the like button. It makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and it's going to help the show grow its audience as it as it shares these videos with more Stargate fans. And please also consider sharing this with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. This is key if you plan on watching live because these talent are working again and schedule changes happen all the time. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days if I get a chance on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. I've not been doing that a lot lately because I threw my lore back out. So that's been fun. So anyway, I appreciate your patience through this. Before I bring in Gary, big thanks to Linda Gate Gabber for all of her work in promoting the show. Thanks to Darren Sumner for the excellent news article that went up, I believe, earlier today on uh, Dean Devlin, the interview that we had with him last week and talking about a Mayan sequel to Stargate and and Bigfoot and the Yeti and everything else that they were planning for Stargate, some surprising stuff. And the moderators are going to be taking your questions for Gary Jones in chat right now. So please be nice to them. So thanks to Summer, Ian, Tracy, Keith, and Jeremy joining us this week for the first time. Without further ado, Mr. Gary Jones. Yay! Hello. Hey, man. How are you? It's good to see awesome. you, my friend. Awesome. Totally awesome. Because what's the point of being anything else? <laughs> you were just showing me um, some. David, don't. Oh, oh, that. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you were bad. Uh, yeah. I didn't realize that you were a uh, a painter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've always been. I've always been um, artistic. My my whole life. And um, it was it was about probably six years ago that um, I went away on a on a kind of a, a get just just a little uh, New Year's Eve uh, holiday with some friends. One of the people that I kind of knew a guy this guy that I sort of knew peripherally because his because his uh, daughter went to the same school as my kids, mm. <clears throat> but we never hung out and I didn't really know him that well anyway. But because this this cabin that we're going to didn't have Wi-Fi or anything like that. And they literally had, uh, they had a tape player with VHF tapes and stuff. And they said, so if we're going to be watching movies, it's going to be like ancient VHS movies. You know? <laughs> so, um, so I thought to myself, well, maybe I'll just take a sketch pad and see if I can do some drawing while I'm up there. And of course, you know, I was up there for like six days, didn't do any drawing. And then on the last day, I'm like, oh, I should do a drawing. So I did a couple of sketches of uh, a couple of portraits uh -huh. and my friend saw it and he goes, Oh my God, that's, I really like your drawing. And, uh, and uh, you know, we chatted about it cause he turns out he was pretty artistic and creative as well. Then he, then, then, then we went home and then he got in touch with me and said, Hey, and sent me some, sent, a, sent me a picture of some art that he had done. And he said, yeah, it kind of inspired me just seeing you do some drawing. And I, I came home and did some drawing <clears throat> and I said to him, well, do you want to come over and draw sometime or just come over to my place on a, maybe a Thursday night? We'll just have some beers and we'll just kind of draw and hang out. And uh, I thought it'd be like just a kind of a fun little thing to do. Well, every Thursday night for six years, it's happened. Oh, how he nice. Comes over, he comes over. And about three months into it, he kept showing up. And I was like going, I, at one point I said, are you, so do you want to, keep doing this and he goes well yeah he goes thursday's art night i told, I told <laughs> he's my already wife, booked I'm, it out yeah he's booked it out and he goes i told my wife i'm unavailable thursday nights so i'm i'll be at gary's drawing just comes over for like you know from eight to like 10 30 11 or whatever and 
we just started to get, we just, we started off with pencil sketching and, uh, and um, went down that road and we just sketched and sketched and sketched. And then finally one day I said to him, hey, why don't we just try painting? Because neither of us could really, knew really how to paint. And um, he's like, yeah, let's go for it. So, because we sort of, we were in a groove now and we both felt comfortable and, you know, it's one thing to sort of, <clears throat> uh do that in front of each other and it turns out i mean it helped because we were sort of at the same level so it was like when i said hey i want to paint he was like yeah let's do it so and then of course he was awesome and uh and so we we kept doing that so basically i've i've you know now added about uh, you know i've got a few paintings that i'm hanging around my place now that i've that i've done and i'm just gonna keep going so there is there is a release in doing that. I, uh, I I used to draw when I was really little, and then I, I got you know eight or nine and just focused on the writing side of of making books and things like that. And a few mm-hmm. years ago, um, Bob Ross came on to Netflix. Oh yeah, <laughs> and I'd watched him on PBS <laughs> as a kid. Yeah. Um, uh, PBS was all I was largely allowed to watch for the formative years of my life and, wow. uh, that and Star Trek, um, and which says a lot about me, I think, but a few, couple, three years ago, a friend of mine had a birthday and we were loving this Bob Ross stuff. So six months before her birthday, I went and looked online and there were authorized Bob Ross, uh, instructors in Phoenix and all over the world, actually, that authorized Bob Ross instructors that are that are licensed to uh, impart his technique. <laughs> and we went Ooh. and for Ooh, we're gonna we're gonna add some clouds here. Oh, look at happy that! Happy little we're, trees, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, happy yeah trees. absolutely. No, just a little yeah. bit over there. Yeah, and, uh, I was so, in, I was in Vietnam, and uh, this is how I'm dealing with it. <laughs> look at this little squirrel. We're raising this squirrel right now. Oh, isn't he fantastic? Absolutely. No, um, but yeah, that was really how it was. I, the, the instructor wasn't, but I mean, that the technique was, and so for 60 bucks, we went in and we had lunch in the middle, but they primed the canvases for us. They gave us our paints and everything that we needed. The instructor presented the, the completed scene in front of us and made a new one while we replicated the technique. And it was fantastic. It was so cool to, to unlock this part of myself that was, was dormant and the painting was crap. It was actually, <laughs> it was actually a little bit better than I thought it would be, but I mean, it's hanging upstairs in the spirit in the guest room, but it, it was so cool to access a part of yourself that, you know, you didn't think was around anymore. You didn't, you know, give much attention to the, the And so many people are like, I can't do that. I don't have a creative bone in my body. Do it, you know, find, you know, just sit down in front of Netflix with, with some paint and, you know, copy what he's doing. I mean, my wife at the time was like, was always on me about like, why aren't you, you know, if I could paint and draw, if I could draw like you, I'd be drawing all the time. And I thought about that, you know, like, and, and that didn't really spur me on like her kind of, you know, pushing me that way, probably you know, poking and prodding that way. Because what I discovered was that because I kind of made, kind of shown up in the world with that particular talent, <clears throat> it it didn't feel like it was anything that I had to work at. Mm. It was just kind of there, and so because it was there, it it just sort of it was kind of dormant. Like I didn't do anything with it. Um, I don't know, like that was for the longest time. That's the only way I can kind of describe what it felt like. Um, it wasn't like I took art lessons and painting lessons and then got to a point and thought, oh, you know what, I've done all these lessons and here I am and I've worked really hard at this. <clears throat> this is something that I don't have to particularly work hard at. That's the odd, the, the, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that in a kind of bragging way. I'm just saying like that's, yeah, that, that's from an observational uh, way. Like <clears throat> the, the first painting I did was, oh, I didn't show you that one. It was of my stepdaughter uh, on a horse, <clears throat> a, a pony that she had. And I started drawing it. And, I, and when I was sort of getting into it, I sent a uh, work in progress <clears throat> excuse my coughing to a uh, to a buddy of mine who lives in Hawaii who's an incredible artist um, 
and he uh just for feedback yeah Yeah. i just said hey look what i'm doing i'm working on painting it was my first painting i ever i ever did and he goes uh you know he he liked it but he goes why are you drawing a horse why aren't you just why aren't you painting an onion he goes most people don't um they don't you know go at like something like a horse it's a complicated animal yeah Yeah. and that's true and but the but and when he said that, huh. that was the first time that I thought, yeah, but I, that, like, that thought never crossed my mind. Like, I just looked at the painting, and because I, I looked at the picture, and because I liked the picture, I went, oh, well, I'll draw this, I'll paint this. That was more like, it was like, well, that's a kind of no-brainer. All I need to do is choose the picture that I want to paint, and I'll be able to paint it. So for him, he was like, his thing was like, well, why don't you start with something really simple instead of something super complex? And I was like, yeah, but I can do this. You know what I mean? So that's that's kind of what I mean about how it sort of lived in me as in it just, mm. it was just kind of there. It, was not, it wasn't me going, oh my God, oh, should I do this? Should I? I was like, no, I'll, I'll do this. Well, it's such the, a, you yes, already the, knew what your target was. You know, you knew where you wanted to begin. Yeah. I, I knew it, I, but I also inherently knew that I could do it. That's the thing. Hey, do you want to see it? Do you want to see a please. picture of the, uh, of, this please. is my, I'll go get it. This is my first painting. And the I, feet, please. The feet, I love the color in the feet. Oh, uh, okay. Hang on just a Thank you. Okay. So as we take this brief break, um, Gary uh, was showing me around his place earlier and uh, was showing some of his his art of his family and that's one of the reasons that this you know started this this conversation so i think he's gonna go and ah here he comes so so this i'm quite proud of wow that's insanely cool man had you ever drawn a horse before no first horse I'm impressed. That is legit. And her expression yeah. and everything else, you captured that emotion. And then the legs, the legs you're talking about. Yes, here. I love the legs. Wow. I love his pattern work, his use of color. I mean, they, yeah. they, they say digits, you know, hands and feet are not easy to do. What's that? Know, they say, you know, hands and feet are, are not easy things to copy. No. So. I, yeah, I know. I know. Oh, and then this. And then this other one was the was the picture that I took of a, of an old guy in Florence on some street sitting outside his store. So that's that's that one. Wow. I love I love your color. I look at that expression, man. Oh man, he's that is great. And you know man. what? You see this right here? Yeah. See all that? Yeah. Okay, so this is it weathering on the wall in. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Hang on, hang on. So, so on the walls in Florence, they're all uh, they're all plaster. Yes, right. They're plaster. So, so no, there's no like you know infrastructure. Oh, we've got money to fix all the buildings. So, so if um, if the plaster gets like destroyed, they just somebody just comes by and just replasters it, and that and then that, and that's they move it. Move on. Yeah. Move on. Right. But a lot of the plaster, like even down here, you can see that by the guy, it just gets really scuffed and just kind of like beat up. And there's all these colors underneath it of like uh, the undercoating. Mm. So when I was painting that part, um, I actually didn't use a paintbrush. I actually thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool if I troweled it on, you know? So so I got my little mixing trowel and I would scoop the paint not mix it with water and then i just like and it was literally like i was putting plaster on a wall and the and then the effect was that it's it's so it's pretty cool the same thing it's it was always what blew me away with bob ross is you're seeing a mountain but it's just pigment that's applied with a certain tool in yeah. a certain pattern to generate yeah. an image the look. The look. and it's it's completely it's deception but yeah. at the end of the day it's amazing. I, thank you for sharing that with us. That's fantastic. Yeah. And so, and so just to kind of wrap up the whole painting thing, I'll now show you a, a 
painting that my son did and my son is 20 like that uh, the picture i showed you yeah he was two he's now 20 he just started painting and i had no idea that my son could paint i, I really had no idea get a load of this okay painting. <laughs> okay okay and i told him when he he came here and painted and when he finished i said well that's not leaving this apartment <laughs> And I basically, I basically hung it up in my place. Hang on, just check okay. out this painting. Okay. <laughs> I like his, I like his kitchenette. Wow. Holy cow! And is this drawn from a from a picture? Is this done from a picture? Yeah. Look at that. What an impressive young man. I wouldn't have let it go either. Well, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I would have kept it too. That's it's pretty really exciting great. for me as a dad to go, what the hell? And you know, it, it's interesting because, <clears throat> because people knew that I drew and, and, uh, and painted. A lot of my friends know me as an artist too. So he starts... Uh, he starts painting and drawing and he's that's his fourth painting and from that fourth that's the fourth painting he's ever done and he's already gotten a commission he's got a commission oh, to, good for him to 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 paint something for somebody at this part-time job that i have the office manager saw yeah. that said oh do you think he could paint this something for me like a little beach scene with some shells and i was like yeah he could so he's going to get, I mean, he's young, he's starting out, but he's already, he's going to get 200 bucks for a painting. I haven't even done that. Nobody's commissioned me to do a painting. And already my son is like earning money from his, it just blows my mind. I don't but, know, Gary, you may get one or two after this. One of, <laughs> or one of you might, we'll see. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, I am, I'll let you know if anyone emails me. Yeah, the gate sure. show at gmail.com. I am completely available to do paintings, and uh, you know, I, you know, I, I think it would be really cool to to do uh, to do a commission piece on something that is not like of my choosing, you know, mm -hmm. like that somebody else wants. Anyway, so wow, be that as it may, um, what was interesting was that people every time they saw his work, they would go, "Oh, you know, well, he's his father's son, and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and all that stuff." And I realized. The more I heard that, the more it came across like, <clears throat> well, you know, he's he's got it from you. And I had to kind of put an end to that. I, really? I, yeah, because I started saying, I, I was going, yeah, I mean, yeah, I can draw. I said, but he is who he is. I don't yeah. want people to keep thinking, oh, you know, he's only got this artistic talent because you've got it, you know? Like he I has his own I, eye. He has his own eye. Yeah. He has his own technique. He has his own, like how he paints. He paints in a hilarious way. Cause my buddy Dana, who comes over on the Thursday night, mm. we were watching, he was here one night. We were and working on this swan painting. And most people, most artists would just like squeeze some paint onto a palette, mix it up. Well, my son sits there. He's got the tube in his hand and he's got like a little, uh, uh, a flat bristled brush. And he just kind of scrapes, scrapes some paint off. Off of the top of the tube? Off of the top of the <laughs> tube. He just squeezes it a little bit. And he just, and it's almost like he kind of slices some paint off. And then, and then he paints like, like he's holding a pencil. That's his approach. That's his, that's his technique. And he's already like, you know, so I'm just watching that going, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Like, not anything I could, I, I couldn't do that. Or I, it doesn't feel right for me to do that, but that's his way of doing that's his it. his approach. Yeah. So, Isn't yeah. So I'm, I, so I'm already trying to pull back from being so connected to his particular skill set or talent. Yeah. You know, I live a creative life. I'm an actor, writer, painter, photographer, all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to choose that life or, you know, that I would think that he would choose that life. So the fact that he's kind of coming at like this thing's kind of, it's like out of the gate, like, Oh my God, like he's not just doodling. He's going at stuff. And it's, I'm and to me, it's like, well, I'm hanging this up in my place. Cause it's, it's <laughs> fantastic. You know? So anyway, 
that's the that's the other side of Walter. I guess that's what Walter <laughs> was doing when he wasn't sitting in his chair in the uh, in the SGC. I, I figured he wouldn't be at home on you know chat boards looking up conspiracy stuff or you know reviewing technical so. documents or something. I mean, he was definitely a gearhead, but I mean, yeah, I suspect he had a he had a creative side as well. So he certainly, I was a, yeah, I mean, yeah. he was a gearhead, but the, but the, but you know, the, the thing that used to make me in retrospect now make me laugh was, and, and of course it made sense in the show is that, you know, I'd be like, I'd be working away doing something like, oh, I can't get the blah, blah, blah. You know, I can't quite, you know, I can't make uh, contact with the mouth or whatever. Right. And Amanda would always come in and go and, and kind of like slide me out of frame, <laughs> you know, it'd be like, <laughs> And she'd be on camera and then she'd go, there you go. And I'd, <laughs> and I'd like slide back in. And I, you know, that happened so many times that I thought, I thought that's, it's such a device because it, it you know, like a storytelling device and a character device to show that uh, Amanda's character was just like, just, you know, kind of computer whiz kid, you know, like she Absolutely. was really, really smart, right? She could have been anything that she wanted to do, which is a wonderful message to impart to people. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. But, but, but it, but it always made me laugh because people would, you know, for the most part, they thought they, they saw me as the guy who ran the gate and fixed the gate and, you know, did, you know, dealt with all the problems or whatever. But if there were certain technical things that in the script I couldn't do, for whatever reason, she would just boot me out. Like you can, you can see that in episodes over many episodes. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm po poking my head in the chat here. Looking at that Swan painting makes me think that your son could paint a convincing one of me emerging from the gate. <laughs> <laughs> or, oh, because of the puddle, the water. It's is that puddle. right? Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly what that is. So yeah, he could paint Ab the puddle. Abarax, thank you for that comment. So. That's what it is. The, the swan's coming back from uh, PX three seven nine two. Hammond, we're good. It's Bring like, the team. Like, we ran out of like, maps. We're sending swans. It's like where's Teal? I don't know, but check out this swan on the ramp. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh god, that's funny. Gary, does Stargates lasting popularity? surprise you uh well i guess years ago i would have said i would have said yes but not anymore it just <laughs> goes on and on and on at, to the point where i mean how many conventions have i have i been at where people are watch the shows went to the conventions and are now back with their kids and they watch them as families so what that says is that that there's something about the ethos of that show that is so family oriented and so kind of like positive and uplifting, right? It's got enough action, it's got enough science, it's got enough comedy, chemistry between the leads. I'm in it, you know. You are. <laughs> Cherry and, on uh, top. And and I think and I think that. If you if you remove the idea of the show, right, like Stargate as a show, and you just talk about those qualities, those are the qualities that are that last. So the show, do you get what I mean? Like the show just is a is a kind of a manifestation of those good qualities. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense if you if you take those qualities. And then you create a show around those qualities. If those show, if those qualities never diminish, and people and 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 draw most people to to them, then of course they're gonna they're gonna watch that show ad infinitum uh, because that's what the show is representing. Mm -hmm. Especially so if it lifts them out of whatever place that they're in and teleports them to somewhere else that makes them feel good. Stargate's oh chicken God. soup. I've always said it. It's chicken soup for the for your soul. Totally chicken soup, and um, uh, I and that's the other thing. I've had I've had so many um, fans come up to me and tell me that that you know they they you know they they either had health issues or they they, they you know they had they went they were going through really tough times in their lives, and so they just plunked themselves down and watched like the ten season box set 
of SG1, and it got them through. It got them through, and and at first, I have to be honest, and like I just didn't get it. I did not get it. I because because I've never done that. I get. I, well, I suppose no. I shouldn't say that. I watched. I watched Breaking Bad five seasons three times, right? Because there's just so much in it, right? Yeah, it's a single and story, watched, and it's a good one. Yeah, yeah, and 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 uh, and uh, and you can go back and you go, oh, you know what's coming, but then you can see that you can watch for the setups, like how they set mm-hmm. stuff up that you know is about to pay off, right? So. So it was less of an anthology like uh, like Stargate uh, Stargate was than it was just a five season story arc. But I also I also binge watched uh, The Wire, which was uh, I think it was I think that was three seasons. I w- uh, yeah, it's a little bit more than that, and I've I've it that I'll seasons. love it. It it's a little bit. I think it's yeah, it's it's wonderful. Everything that that I've read says that that I'll like it. Have you, have you seen it? I've not seen it yet. Nope, I have it. My buddy said he actually bought it for me. He said, "Watch this," and I I haven't had a chance to watch it. And you it, haven't but... watched it? Well, <laughs> my list is long, Gary. <laughs> the interesting thing about well, well, first off, what they did that was really, really so well thought out about the wire that I love is that there, it takes place in the city of Baltimore, mm-hmm. and uh, in the eighties, I guess eighties. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say the eighties. I think five seasons. Yeah. Okay. So. So then they took all these different areas of the city, like uh, politics, uh, um, media, you know, the newspapers. Like education. Uh, yeah. Education. So yeah. stuff that happened in the schools. And then like, and, they, and so they focused on each one of those, which in, it, in and of itself is like, oh my God, what a massive undertaking. But they also uh, have the same theme tune uh, every every season played by different people. So huh. uh, Tom Waits does one. I forget who else does. But you can literally, if you wanted to, and if you're on Spotify, you could go and download the five separate versions of the opening the music theme. to The Wire. And they're all fantastic. They're wow. all really, really good. Yeah. But anyway... What was what was tough about watching The Wire at first was the the was the black kids talked in a way that it was like another language and I couldn't I couldn't understand it and I could see where people would kind of give up on it like mm-hmm. I don't get this you know but but I stuck with it and I eventually gained an ear for it like mm-hmm. like I go oh, okay now. I mean, that's one of the things as you, that you do as an actor. You have to, you have to tune your ear if you have to do an accent, or yeah. you know, you have to be able to like listen to the subtleties and the nuances and the words that just. And so they wrote it like that, like you're in, you're right there, and it's real. But it was very hard to uh, decipher at first. And I, in the first like maybe three episodes, I would say I was like, oh, what am I? What am I in for? But people kept saying to me, if you like Breaking Bad, you've got to watch The Wire. Yep. So That's like, the oh, same I got. I I'm looking forward to it. Then I was absolutely hooked. It was, it was great. And Idris Elba is fantastic. You know, yes, like, he is. He's the reason know? I I asked my buddy about it because we had just seen a film with him and Kate Winslet. So it, it's funny, you know, like these shows like The Wire, Breaking Bad, Stargate, and I mean, Stargate, I think, went more places, pardon the pun, you know, uh, story wise. But in many respects, the content is more relevant now than it was, especially with our advances in technology. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost as if you're talking, you talking about Stargate. I am talking. I went back to Stargate now. Yeah, that, right. it's, yeah. it's almost as if, you know, we do have off world teams bringing back stuff with the velocity and it, the inertia, which our, our society is transforming with these little devices. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think. To be honest, I, I I agree with you there, but I also think even more to the point is uh, in terms of relevance is that in kind of the way Star Trek was mm. is is uh, it's about acceptance. It's about acceptance, and and if you're talking about another race that you go see or the race that comes through the puddle into Earth, it's about diversity. It's about inclusion, and that and that message couldn't be more rel- uh, relevant right now with what is going on, you know, not just in the States, but, you know, with nationalism and whatever around the world. Mm-hmm. And so Stargate 
is the is the antithesis of um, you know closed borders. I mean, the Stargate is like it's a fluid it's a fluid border, right? And uh, and the fact that they could go and help people and come back and maybe have to you know if they were a warring faction they come back they have to fight them and defeat them or whatever. But I mean that's part of the world too. But still the idea that people can travel to other places and the and and your where your first impulse is to not pull out a gun, your first impulse is to try to connect mm -hmm. and find a commonality between you know humans and whatever uh, race they they meet on a different mm -hmm. planet. You know, but so, it's not just like necessarily. I'm thinking of learning curve. I'm thinking of the one where the little girl comes to to the SGC to to get knowledge, and Jack finds out that she's going to go back and essentially get her brain sucked out, and that she's going to be a vegetable afterwards. You know, and right. this culture, that's normal for this culture, right? And but that's how they that's how this society has evolved to obtain knowledge, and they right. sacrifice kind of sacrifice their kids as a result. And because of Jack's interaction, like originally he doesn't want anything to do with this culture at all. He steals the kid off the base for crying out loud and takes her to a school to show her how to paint and how to play. And because of th him taking the time to do that and not giving up on the kid, he comes back to the planet later on and finds out that not only did they assimilate the knowledge that she was supposed to get when she went to the planet, but they also assimilated Jack's time with the kid and have now decided that after the kids have done their part for society, they will be taught like earth children are taught. Yeah. And it, it was, that is one of my favorite episodes of the show because it says that, you know, there are some practices out there that we look at and we go, this is nuts. That doesn't mean that we can't learn from one another. And right. maybe come to a higher level of understanding all the same. Right. And I mean, look, that's what Star Trek was doing back mm -hmm. in the 60s. You know, they would like, land, you know, go where no man's gone before, beam down on a planet and go, okay, what's going on here? Who are these people? You know, as opposed to going, okay, we're humans, we're superior. Let's get down there. Let's, uh, let's kill whoever we need to uh, take what we can from them and then just like move on, leave, you know? Yeah. Kind of parasitical. Yeah. I'd like to go back into your origins as an actor, if I may. Tell us, um, so Dial the Gate is designed to be an oral repository of, of Stargate. So the people who made it and created it and turned it into what it is. And you are one of those key players. And I'd like to go back and discover or discuss uh, your origins as an actor. I'd like to, you to talk a little bit about where you're from. And who you were as a young person, and uh, what made you into um, the person that you are today? Um, <clears throat> well, there's a lot of questions in there, so I'll just go back. And I apologize. First of all, <laughs> first of all I'll say that uh, I had zero uh, aspirations to perform. None. Oh. <laughs> I, th I was reminded, I, I thought the other day, I remember this one time when... Um, I must have been in about grade seven, living in Montreal. It was a year before we moved back to Wales. We came out from Wales, um, and I was in I was in Montreal for like grade six and seven. And then we moved back for another two years. But while I was in Montreal, um, we were putting on some kind of, I guess, Christmas variety show or something. And one of the teachers said. Uh, we need like a comedy routine. We need a comedy sketch. Who wants to do that? I can't and imagine. I, and I, I couldn't believe it. I put my hand up and nobody else did. So I was like, was oh, that okay. out of character for you to put your hand up or were you participatory? Uh, I was sort of participatory, but I can't quite figure like that was, I almost surprised myself by doing that, you know? And <clears throat> And she goes, okay, well, anybody else? And nobody wanted to because they, they, you know, they were too scared of it. But I didn't really, I just thought, oh, I'll, just do, I'll do something. And, uh, and I came up with, with the age-old um, uh, uh, funny piano routine. So what I, what I did was I went home and I, and I 
uh, I found um, an old, uh, you know, classic, a piece of classical piano music mm -hmm. that my parents had on a record. And I listened to a bunch of them and I thought, oh, okay, <clears throat> what one is long enough that I can, you know, if I have to do like a three minute sketch or whatever, like what, what section can I do that I can have fun with? And so I found this piece and then I just kind of memorized it and knew it inside out. And so then I would uh, practice like I'd come out and I'd, and I'd bow and then I'd go to sit down and I'd almost fall off the stool. I was, look, I was in grade seven, but yeah. like the parents were killing themselves laughing. And then it was like, and then it was like, you know, hands up here to like the sort of the Bugs Bunny. Remember the Bugs Bunny? Like, <laughs> Absolutely. Like this, With the gloves like and yeah with the gloves and so it was like kind of like that and and i had my back to the audience they never saw me and it was a little bit like bugs bunny meets victor borga you know and uh and then just playing and then and then uh, uh if there was a if there was a break in the in the piano i'd just be waiting and you know <laughs> all that kind of thing and i i remember that my mother particularly was shocked she had no idea. She didn't even really know that I was practicing it. She didn't, they didn't, they weren't that involved. You know, okay. they were like, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm doing this thing at the school. And you know, she's like, okay. And they knew they were going to come and watch the show. And they, and so when they saw me do it, that was the first time they'd seen me do it. They did. I didn't say to them, Hey, can I just rehearse in front of you? I just did it on my own thinking, whatever I think is funny will probably be funny. And, and, and I've grown up like that too. I mean, that's that, that, that thought in terms of writing comedy has always stood me in good stead. I've written plays, I've written comedy scripts. And really the only thing that I have to go by is does it make me laugh or does it make me and my co-writer laugh? Because what else do you have to go by? No, you your know? own instincts. And my own instincts. So I was like, so I learned at an early age I would say to kind of trust in my own instincts, but then that's all I did. I didn't do anything else after that. I was a kind of a shy kid, a little fearful kid. Um, but I, but again, I was always creative and, um, and I ended up, uh, I barely made it through high school cause I was like the worst student, really terrible student. I was in summer school. I failed math every year. I was in summer school. Uh, so it was really hard getting summer jobs cause it was like, yeah, I'm going to be, uh, you know, doing calculus uh, all morning. So I can't- so I'm not available for that, yeah. Not available for that. Yeah. But, um, and then I went to college and got an advertising diploma at a college in- Advertising. Hamilton. Advertising. And so I graduated from, uh, from an advert, with an advertising diploma and I got a job working at like little ad agencies. And around about the age of, 27 26 27 or whatever i was living near toronto and um i i one day i came across this little ad in the newspaper it was like a little classified ad and uh and it said improv classes for a month in toronto improvisational comedy classes and i it was it was one of those moments uh, i mean i know it sounds all kind of artsy fartsy but it was like a voice spoke to me says you have to do this you, you have to do it. Yeah. And I didn't even really know what it was, but I did, but the voice said, you've got to do it. So because I didn't really know what it was, I phoned up a buddy of mine who was also a very funny, good storyteller or whatever, a great buddy of mine, uh, Kevin Frank. And I said, Kev, you, I said, do, do you know what improv comedy is? And he's like, mm, not nah, kind of, not really. But, and I go, well, you have to take these classes with me. And he goes, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so, now that's a friend. I <laughs> that's a friend. have a vague and idea. That, let's do it. And that's, what could and go that's wrong? What, that, what could possibly go wrong? And that's improv too, which is very yes. And, you know, always like agreeing and moving on and building and adding. And so, um, and so we took a couple of these, we took these classes for a month and we were like, Oh my God, this is fantastic. We just loved it. And from there, we they gave us more that was just a like it was like a little taster course like that if you were any good at it you could you could go and and um, go to other places and study it so they told us all about toronto theater sports and second city because second city was in toronto too mm. so we just got obsessed and we started performing at theater sports and then we took um 
We took classes at Second City, and unbeknownst to us, when you when you signed up for Second City classes, they were it was basically like paid auditions. You were paying them to be in their workshop, but they were keeping an eye on you, as in like you know we could use this person down the road. And both Kevin and I got plucked out of the workshop system yeah. and, and hired by Second City. First of all, Kevin got into the touring company, National Touring Company, and uh, and then I was kind of working with other improv groups in Toronto. And then he got moved up to the main stage, which is where place, which is the same stick, excuse me, same <laughs> stage where like John Candy, Martin Short, oh, Dave okay. Thomas, uh, uh, Dan Aykroyd, all those Toronto people got their Gilda Radner, all got their start on that stage at the old fire hall in Toronto. So Kev got moved up there. And that meant that there was this spot open in the touring company. So they just called me and said, do you want to, do you want to be in the touring company? And I was like, I was like, yeah, for sure. So I, so I took, so I signed up and of course, instantly it was like hardly making any money, you know, it's theater, you know? And, um, but I also had my, my other job. So I had a day job in advertising and then I would go do these night gigs. Well, what happened was ultimately they booked a tour from from um, Toronto out to Winnipeg and back. And we we're just performing all the way along, right? As far as Winnipeg. And when I came back from that tour, I just went into the office and I said, I have to quit. I can't, I, so I literally, I'm one of those people, you know, when they're always saying, oh, don't quit your day, day job. Well, I quit my day job. I walked in, I said, I can't do it. I, I, I kind of found my tribe. You knew what you wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. I was like, oh. Come hell or high water. This world has been open to me. This is where I have to be. I found my peeps. This is what I'm going to do. So I can't, as much as I loved advertising, because it was a, it was kind of like business plus creativity. And I, and it I is. liked it. It's just not that like I didn't like it. I was dissatisfied. It's just that I was like, oh, I have to, this is the world I have to go into. And I'm committed to this now. So I quit. My boss is like, oh, okay, well, that's a drag, but see you later. So, so then I, then I just started doing it kind of uh, full time and, and focusing on um, performing. And then after about two years in the touring company, they offered me a job in Vancouver at Expo 86 because they were sending a troupe out to perform for the duration of the fair. And I'd never been to Vancouver before. And they, you know, and I just thought in the spirit of improv, they said, do you want to go? And I said, yep, like, yep, I'll go for sure. So, so that's what happened. That's how come I got to the West coast. Um, and uh, so we, and Ryan Stiles from whose line is it anyway, yes. was in the, was in the, in the troupe with us and Pat McKenna from the red green show <laughs> super hilarious guys and we just worked our way across the country and we got we landed in vancouver and then we just performed at expo for um for for six months so i had a so it was great to be in vancouver uh with a job you know like a full-time job i i worked six days a week eight shows a week six days a week eight shows a week and this is improv this is this is well what it was was like the this touring company the touring company always did they did a show that looked, it was like the best of Second City stage sketches. So, so we would do this performed, you know, uh, scripted uh, two, uh, in, two act um, show. And then once that show ended, we would do a half an hour of improv. So it was like, you know, it was like a two and a half hour show that we did uh, eight days, eight, eight times a week. And it was great. And it really brought up my, my improv chops and, um, well, you have to be spontaneous, you know, and not only that, you have to be pretty well read to connect a lot of these dots together because, oh, oh you know, yeah, and and know what's going on in the news and everything else to and bring all of that to bear. So, well, it's interesting that you say that because just to just to jump ahead a number of years, one of the reasons after like so after Second City ended and I and I moved into working with Vancouver Theater Sports, which is now a globally respected um, uh, improv company. Uh, I was with them for about 15 years. And when it, it, when it came time for me to kind of like, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of done, you know, this, I, this has run its course. It was around the time, because when we started, nobody had laptops, nobody had personal computers, yeah. nobody had smartphones, none of that. So, you know, every week there was like four new movies out 
And a lot of the suggestions that the audience yelled would be, you know, give us the name of a movie. And it would be like the latest movie that had come out with whoever, right? Like if it was like Die Hard, you know, it was like Die Hard. It was so easy to just go and watch Die Hard. Yeah. Understand it and go, okay, they're going to yell this out. So we got to be prepared. So there were certain things, certain cultural things that we had to be on top of, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, movies were a big part of that because that's what people, that was the other, there were other form of entertainment. But if there was a, you know, blockbuster novel, like say, for instance, it was like, not this, but like, say it was like the Da Vinci Code mm-hmm. and it came out and it was like massive, then we'd have to kind of know. Be abreast about of it. it. Yeah. We'd have to be abreast of it and get it, you know, we'd do the Coles notes or read it and kind of get a sense of it because ultimately you inevitably you knew that suggestion was going to get yelled out so you couldn't get up and go well, i don't know what that is or i haven't mm-hmm. read it because the audience is because everybody else had so so there was a there was a point at which you could keep up with all the cultural references and what were going on and then when when smartphones came in and when computers and the internet hit it was like it was like an avalanche of information oh. and oh. i just went Okay, I'm, you know, I was at an age where I was like, I can't, I don't have the energy to keep up with this anymore. I just, <laughs> I just don't want to do this anymore. So that there was a wave of us that kind of like, we, like really killed it for many years on stage. And we all sort of left and we were replaced by a much younger kind of like tech savvy, more culturally <laughs> app savvy, yeah, uh, savvy group. And it was like, the stage is yours. Yeah. In, enjoy because you know what? Go, like, go for it because we've had our time, you know? Yeah. That's fair. Um, yeah. So it was fair. So, anyway, uh, and then as far, and then just to hook this into acting, um, I, when, when Expo ended, I had no idea what I, if I should go back to, if I should go back to Toronto or stay in Vancouver because I didn't have any work. Right. And I'm like, what are we going to do? You know? And so I was like, oh, should I stay? I need a sign. I need a sign. And I got the sign in the funniest, like most, on retrospect, I see it was a sign, but at the time I didn't realize it was. I got an audition for this show <laughs> being shot in, Van- in Vancouver called Danger Bay. And it starred Donnelly Rhodes as this guy, as this single dad with two kids, uh, two teenage kids. And he worked at the Vancouver Aquarium. He was like, he was like, um, uh, you know, it was like a kid's adventure show kind of thing. And it, and it just kills me. It's like Danger Bay. You know, I'm imagining them pitching the show going, okay, here we go. <laughs> there's there's a bay and there's danger. Danger Bay. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't It's going to be huge. It wasn't even, yeah. And it was huge. It was like one of the most popular shows. It was like- Wow. It was huge. You can go on and find episodes of Danger Bay. And uh, I was in it. I did this one episode. But anyway, so I go to audition for this show. My agent says to me, you're auditioning for the uh, actor category part. I go there. I learn my lines. I'm like, I'm like, I got to get this part because I need the work. Yeah. And I was so determined to, to, uh, to get the part that when I go in to read with the casting director, the producer and the director is sitting right there. And she gives me my cue line and I can't find my cue line on the page. I'm like, oh, where, uh, sorry, uh, where are you? Where's that? And she goes, it's at the top of the page. And I go, oh, oh, okay. And I still couldn't quite find it. I said, can we just start again? She goes, yeah. And and so this doesn't look good on her, bringing an actor in who can't yeah. find his place on the page, right? So we try it again. I cannot find this cue line. It's, I, it's like I, I'm frantically scanning, and I go, I'm sorry, I... I don't know where this is on the page. They give you the wrong document? She comes over to me. She's like, and she's she's now kind of like slightly pissed off. Yeah. Because it's like I'm embarrassing her, yeah. right? And she goes, oh. and then she looks at it. She goes, oh, you got the wrong sides. You picked up the wrong sides. And I, and I go, oh, and I just kind of laughed it off. I was so kind of like I didn't care. I was like, I'd done enough improv that you couldn't really embarrass me. I didn't, yeah. it was oh, whatever. I just laughed. And I think the director, Al Simmons, saw me laugh and not get flustered. And he goes, let him read it anyway. So I read this, <laughs> so I read this part. I read the part. I get the part. And it was the guest star. 
So, so I, I auditioned for a part that had like, like three lines. Uh huh. And I, and, and I, and I fluke into the guest starring role. Well, you were and impervious I, to that type of an encounter. You know, you weren't going to let it bother you because you, you've been, let it in pra- you. you've been practicing this kind of thing. And I didn't know what I didn't know. So it was like, yeah, okay. And I get the part and I'm on there for like four days. I think this is back in like 1987. Yeah. I think I made like $2,000 for the week. And I was like, oh my God. And that money. was my, that was my sign. That was enough that, that um, we could stay in Vancouver. We had a big, you know, my, my bank account was padded somewhat. And then I could just work like a demon then at theater sports and, you know, getting, trying to get book gigs and do shows and kind of stay ahead of the curve. So that's how come I ended up. And, you know, I thought at the time, I was like, well, that was easy. I just went in, read, read, read for the wrong part, got the guest star. Oh, this is going to be a cakewalk. Then I didn't work for like two years. Ugh. You know, you know, because I because ultimately I didn't know what I was doing. You know, that was it. It was a total fluke. But I was so kind of caught up in my own like, oh, yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. No work. And yeah. I was like, how can I not? How can I not? I couldn't figure out why how I couldn't get work. And uh, it was only when I landed a part on a show called Wise Guy that. Um, and and and, I, and they said, oh yeah, you're getting you're, you've landed the part of like a politician's aide, you know, like a like a like the state attorney or something like that, or some kind of. And the politician was Chaz Palminteri, right? The okay. actor. Uh huh. So I all I got to do was hang out with Chaz Palminteri <laughs> for like four days on this episode of Wise Guy, and I had no lines. I didn't have to talk. And I just had to carry his jacket because it was like, that was my job. Right. Like, yeah, you were an jacket. aide. Uh-huh. I was an aide. You heard all my jacket, yeah. kid. And so I got to kind of watch him. And the bad guy in Wise Guy, the villain, was Robert Davi. You know, and he always plays the kind of bad guy. So the heavy. There, was the, there was this scene. There was this scene where we're on the docks and they're having a confrontation. Chaz Palmateri, the politician, is having a confrontation with the Robert Davi, the villainous mafia businessman, right? And imagine now it's outdoors, there's outdoor ambience, there's like tankers, you know, moored. There's a, there's a crowd of people like dock workers all, you, you know. You got the water, sound of the water. Yeah. Got the sound of the water, seagulls, bird, it's all this ambience. And and I'm standing right next to Charles Palminteri while he's having this little sort of tete-a-tete with, um, with um, Robert Davi. And it's all kind of like threatening, you know what I mean? So instead of like going off and yelling and whatever, Robert Davi is smoking a cigarette and he's just, he's just kind of going like this. He's like, yeah, well, you know, it's either going to go that way or it's not going to go that way. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like. On camera. Yeah. And I'm like, of course he's mic'd. He's mic'd, right? But so it's all, but I'm standing there and I'm going, I cannot hear Robert Davi. I have no idea what he's saying. And I'm watching him. They do a few takes. And he does the same thing over and over. Nobody says anything to him like, Robert, you don't want to, you know, you know, pick it up a bit. So he does it over and over the same way. And at, and at some point I go, I go to myself, oh my God, what's this guy, what's this guy doing? He's not even doing anything. He's like, he's doing nothing. And then I go, wait a sec, he's doing nothing. Oh my God, that's it. And that was my acting lesson that was my acting lesson where I, where I transformed from theater acting to TV acting because it's a whole different deal. And I saw that in order to act on TV, you have to do nothing. You, you know, you, you obviously act the part. Yeah, but, but you're you, not emoting in front of an, you're not no. trying to reach the back of an audience, you know? And that's, and that's, yeah. what, I, that's what I had been trying to do every audition since Danger Bay. I was like, oh, you know, it was like the cowardly lion, right? And then I see Robert Davi, this thing clicks, and I, and I could not wait to get to my next audition. And I started essentially imitating Robert Davi, not, not his character, but doing what he did. Yeah, his method. I started getting callbacks. The people behind, sitting behind the table would kind of lean in because they couldn't quite hear what I was saying. And all I did was, David, and I swear to God I did this, I imagined my head inside a television set 
And I thought, <laughs> I just went, okay, as soon as I'm going to start acting, this is what they would see. Like, I'm going to pretend that all they can see is a close up of me, not my body, but right. just my head. And, uh, and so I started acting like that. And they all started with like, what's he saying? Oh, he must be really good because we can't hear him. You know, not, he must be really good. He's not doing anything. Is that, is that Robert Davi? I don't know. You know so, so, so I started getting callbacks and booking gigs. And I was like, okay, okay, fair enough. Now something's I, working. I, something's working. Yeah. And then can I just tell you very briefly Please. my other, my other uh, favorite? Uh, I've told this story numerous times. I won't go into the whole story, but I will tell you from an acting perspective. I didn't realize it at the time that I was getting the ultimately the ultimate acting lesson from Mickey Rooney when um, I was on a show called The Black Stallion. I was a, I was just a guest star. <laughs> I was the I was the horse's vet, and Mickey Rooney shows up. Uh, he's just a ball of energy. He comes on set. And he's like he's like okay, what where are we? What are we doing? You know, like he just never prepped. And of course, I've got all my lines memorized, my cue, you know, Mickey's cue lines memorized, you know, and I'm going to just act like the vet, right? So he, so, so Mickey goes, uh, he goes, uh, uh, somebody got a, somebody got a script. And I'm like, what? And, and they go, they hand him a script and he literally goes like this. He goes, he goes, uh, okay. All right, let's go like that. Like, and I, and I realized. And it was in? That was, no, I mean, I realized before we shot, that was Mickey learning his lines. That's all it took for him? Well, or, that's all, or that's all that he bothered to do? That's all that he bothered to do, David. He wow. just looked and sort of got the gist of it. Oh, my God. Right? <laughs> so, you can imagine, I'm like, I got all my lines memorized. Mickey, Mr. Gisty over here, they yell, they yell uh, action, and Mickey starts just going at me like he's like he's like oh doc doc there's something wrong with the black i don't know what's happening to the black you gotta take a look and like none of his lines like not like none of his lines but it was basically him calling the vet in to say something's up with the black we don't know what it is you got to take a look at the horse and tell us what it is right which essentially is what the scene was when you call a vet in is like what's going on i don't know something's up with the black you can can you take a look at her uh, you know, whatever, right? But he just threw all these lines at me. And of course, I'm standing there looking at him like he's nuts. And I'm waiting for my cue line. And there's no cue line. And then Mickey mm -hmm. stops talking. He just stops. And then he just looks at me. Like this. And, I, and I'm looking at him. I'm so transfixed by Mickey Rooney just like eyeballing me. And the director just goes, cut. Problem, Gary? Like, because I didn't say my line, right? Uh, and he didn't course, deliver his cue. He did yeah. your, your and cue. I, yeah, and you think I'm going to say that about Mickey Rooney? No. Yeah, Mickey. Uh, there was no cue line from Mickey Rooney, so I go, <laughs> uh, I go. Sorry, uh, brain fart. Can we go again? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mickey notices this and he pulls me aside and he goes, he goes, hey kid, come here. Okay, this is how it's going to go. They're going to yell action. I'm going to start talking. When I stop talking. You talk. <laughs> I go, okay, Mickey, I got it. <laughs> Thanks for the heads so up. It didn't, so in a way, it didn't matter <laughs> what Mickey said. Yeah. He just said, wait until I stop. Yeah. And I thought, isn't that how people communicate? Like generally, I mean, you know, unless you're watching a presidential debate, I mean, people don't like, you know, <laughs> yeah. they don't talk over top of one another. But generally, somebody says something, there's a pause, the other person talks. And Mickey was like, yeah, just just do that. And again, it's like the simplest of things that you learn because there's a, there's a, you know, you feel like you're on the spot, right? Like there's a big production happening. There's a lot of money being spent. You know, people are waiting on you to deliver at one point in time. Yeah. 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 And so you can't mess it up. So what I discovered was that somebody like Mickey Rooney can just, he just says whatever he feels like it. As long as he sort of gets the general idea of cross, mm -hmm. he could do that. And my lines had to be correct, but he, but, but just learning that, just, just getting a reminder from Mickey Rooney, like when I stop talking, you talk. <laughs> oh my God. 
that's like, an, that's like, you don't need to take acting, co- acting lessons, you know, like from acting coaches, you just need to know that. I remember being in, uh, on set geez, during season 10 of uh, production of, well, SG one, obviously the other two didn't get that far. Um, season 10 of SG one. And I'm not going to name the actor, but there was, it was Paul McGillian. <laughs> no. no, there was, there was heavy, heavy technical dialogue. And it's one of the things that you just had to do from time to time as the gearheads. And mm-hmm. this this particular actor, we we were we were being facilitated by the the publicist. And we were it was late in the evening and someone had brought in soup. You know, they were really good about that, like having like a hot meal. It was it was cold in Vancouver and raining. Yeah. And we were like, what's what's going on? Because there hadn't been a shoot in a little bit. And the publicist came over and, and said to us, so and so is having trouble with their lines. There's a lot of techno babble and they're 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 having difficulty. And mm-hmm. it's like, oh my gosh, I what you you have to like 150, 100, 150 people are waiting on you to spit this out, you know, oh, yeah. this this gobbledygook techno babble. And if it is not in the correct sequence, you can't Mickey Rooney it, no. you know, then they can't move forward. I was right. like, what a nightmare that must be, you it's, know, it's, the, the pressure is you don't realize it. Until, you don't what you don't realize is until you start messing up your lines and you have to start at the beginning and doing, oh, can we take that again? Oh, sorry. Ah, you know, once that happens a couple of times, the 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 pressure is instantaneous. And it's a lot of it is self-generated by the actor because they feel they feel suddenly they're carrying the weight of the production on their shoulder because they can't yeah you know deliver this they're burning uh, cash waiting on you to get it together burning cash and sometimes I mean if the leads say fall into like a laughing fit you know the the production will kind of put up with that but if you're like me if you're like me and You know, it'd be like, Gary, can you get it together? Like I, it it can happen at a certain level, but below that, no. But there, but there were times when it was so much techno babble that people, oh, and the, 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 the real killer one would be if there was a tracking shot where the camera's following you talking through, and then you had to, and then the, the scene ended on your, on your line at the, at the end of that tracking shot. If you messed up the your line at the end of the tracking shot then it's like back to the beginning and you have to say everything again because they're they're like this is how we're shooting this shot we're we're, we're dollying through and we're following you and we're tracking you it's like so a continuum were, you know when was, they go around that loop in yeah, continuum yep yeah, and they couldn't and they, they're like well we're not we're not um chopping this up yeah. we're not fixing this in post this is it and you have to get it um yeah yeah i know like that that happened lots and and you know stargate you've got all you, you know it's it's essentially time travel and interdimensional travel so you've got so it's like scientific and i found yeah. that sometimes some of the stuff i i was given some stuff occasionally like blocks of dialogue and i would just sh- shit my pants i'd be like oh my god am i gonna say this one time i had to do a walk and talk with richard Dean anderson <laughs> And I had looked at the script and I had missed this part. I would, I would always flip through. They get the script. I go, okay, blah, 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 Walter, Walter, Walter. Okay. And then I go through. This has got to be zero hour. No, I got a, I got a, I missed this one little scene where it was like Jack gets off the, you know, O'Neill gets off the elevator. The elevator. Uh, and I meet him and I walk with him down the thing. And I'm basically bringing him up to speed on the other SG teams yeah. of, uh, on what planet they're on. I look at this thing before we shoot it and I go, what scene is this? And they go, well, it's this scene. And I go, Oh, I didn't realize that I was in that scene. I, oh, no. I, hadn't, I hadn't read it. I hadn't read it. And they give it to me. And I go, Oh my God. And it was like a block of dialogue. Yeah. Like this, that I was just like talking. It was just totally expositional. And it had about six planets in there. Right. Like PX nine seven point two. The planets yeah. had to have been a bear. Get them all straight, David. 
So I see it and I think to my, so we have to rehearse it a bunch of times because they wanted to know, because it was a walk and talk, they wanted to know where we were going to end up. So they said, let's just rehearse it a bunch of times. So instead of using that time to memorize all the planets, I just think to myself, well, I'm just giving them the update on whatever I said. So I just made them up. I just, I just, I just made up the planets and I'd be like, like, God, oh, PX3, 742, they're back, you know, SG2 is back from that. And then SG3 that was going to, is, is heading out to uh, PX9, 712. And I was just pulling numbers out of my ass. I did never then, know this. Yeah, but hang on, but hang on. Just before we shoot, and I'm not kidding you, this is not a word of a lie. Just before we shoot, the script supervisor comes up to me and goes, uh, Gary, are you, are you aware that you've been saying different planets every time? And I, and I go, yeah, yeah, I, I am. I know. And she goes, she goes, well, you know, you have to, you have to say the planets. You have to say it as written. And I go, I used to go, yeah, but we're just, I mean, I'm just talking about the planets. It's like, 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 why do I have to memorize them? And she goes, because we go there. because we go there and i look at her and i go oh my god and now i'm just and i have to look at my sides again and i have to memorize them in about 30 seconds and i managed to pull it off david don't ask me how i did it i did it but i was just dying I'd wasted all this time. I could have been like memorizing as yeah. we're talking. Because when you're when you're rehearsing just for blocking, yeah. I could be looking at my script like this and just, you know, whatever, Jack, 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 you know, TX3, 912, whatever. No, I I just I knew the words around them, but I just like threw I just made up the planets. Yeah, you, know, you forced them in and they came back out. You know, you just had to do it. So I had to do it. And that's what happens when you when you're uh, when you're doing technical uh, jargon like that on a show like that did do you have any questions from fans or? I, we do i'm going to get to them in, in just a second here uh did you see the the feature film in the theaters you mean the original the original film with with uh, kurt russell kurt yeah. russell james spader yeah. yeah i did what was your impression of it i thought it was okay okay like i wasn't i was like oh it's kind of cool i mean i just well, i remember uh Kurt Russell's buzz cut is flat top. <laughs> That's true. And I really like James Bader. He was like, I mean, I thought the show was like perfectly cast. Um, and uh, I thought it was an interesting concept. But for me back then, sci-fi wasn't really my thing. I mean, that was one of the things, that, that was one of the films that everybody saw because it was one of the films that was out. And when we were improvising, they would yell Stargate and we'd sort of have to do something around Got stuff. it. It was one of the films that was like a, you know, in the, in the cinemas. Yeah, it was in the public consciousness at the time. So you went for public... research as much as entertainment. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I, I so when my so when my when my agent called me up and said, "Hey, they're they're making a they're making a series out of Stargate. Um, have you seen the film?" And I said, "Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen the film. I know the film." And then I think I rented it. I think at that point then it was it was like I went to Blockbuster and I literally rented it on VHS and watched it a bunch of times and they and the they gal said, reading all the numbers. <laughs> no, there was a there was a there was a character in there that was that, that they were loosely basing this technician on was was a guy uh, kind of like an Air Force guy but he was sort of like a freelance uh, right. computer guy and he was like in a Hawaiian shirt and so there was With this whole pencil in his mouth yeah. Yeah, and he wasn't really a military guy, but he knew computers. And they said, so it, he's a technician. So have a look at that character and just sort of... So when, when I went into audition for them, I just made it a comedic uh, read because I thought, well, you know, I think they said something like, he doesn't really... The, um, the Air Force needs him more than he needs the Air Force. That was the, that was the sort of dis character description of this guy. And... Um, and I thought, oh, okay, so he doesn't really give a shit. He's, you know, he's like, whatever, you could fire me. I don't care. I'll get a job somewhere else. You know, whatever. You have to listen to me. So I had, so I went in with a kind of like that kind of attitude, like, ah, yeah, whatever. And I, you'd already known the director at this point, Mario Zapardi. 
yeah, but I didn't know that until I literally walked into the okay. room. As soon as they open the door and Mario's there and he sees me because he's just finished uh, uh, like a, a, about a month prior. He had uh, directed an episode of Outer Limits with me as a, like a ballistics expert. Got it. And that was all technical jargon. And I have to come in and give like a get like give like a rapid fire ballistics report, and uh, and and so I was able to pull that off, which made his job easier, you know. And uh, so when he sees me, he goes, "Oh, chief, it's you! Oh my God, you're gonna be perfect!" And so, you know, and I thought, "Oh, great, I'm gonna have fun with this." And I turned, I made it into a big comedy thing, and Brad Wright and Michael Greenberg were just like tears rolling down their eyes, laughing. And uh, when they, when I was leaving the audition, Mario walks me to the door, and I said, uh, I said, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. That was good. You know, trying to get some feedback or a sense of how I'd done. And he goes, Oh, chief, that was great. That was great. But uh, you know, not that big. <laughs> In other words. You'd been like a little over the top. Tone it down. <laughs> and, and then he closed the door and I'm just standing there going, no. Like I thought I'd totally blown it. Yeah. And then I got a call back and I was the only person called back. And I just had to tone it down and I got the job. So that's how come I got into Stargate. Wow. Super fun. Super fun I, uh, ride. I do that's have fun. some fan questions here for you. Oh, uh, please. I want to answer them. <laughs> Nathan, Nathan says, did you ever get bored doing the same thing every episode, essentially? Uh, well, Nathan, yeah, there was a, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there was, there was a level, there was a level of boredom, but that's only because, you know, the, the joke in the business is how do you get an actor to complain? Give him a job, you know, that's, that's a, that's a standard <laughs> acting <laughs> joke. It's because every actor will find something to bitch about, uh, you know, even when they they're on like a like a great show, long running and everything. So <laughs> at some point, I would be like, oh god, I wish I could kind of do more stuff. But at this, but then I would just get pulled back into reality and go, you know, I got to be grateful for this fantastic gig that I have. And I would sort of like put those feelings of boredom or you know aside, because I think when you're I think boredom can lead to ingratitude, mm. and I was definitely not uh, ungrateful. I was very, very grateful. So, I mean, that surfaced a little bit. But you know, towards the end of the like, like in the in the run of the show, they uh, they had me firing machine guns. I went off world. I did all sorts of stuff, you know. But that that came about because because they kept me in the show and they got to know me. And the more they knew me, the more they gave me to do. And so it was kind of like a, it was like a kind of a trust thing. So when people say, like Nathan is suggesting that I did this to the same stuff over and over, I sort of I, I take exception to that a little bit because yes, I my job is essentially to be at the computer opening and closing the iris, but they just they just opened up my world for me, and certainly in season eight with Rick, when, yeah, when, when Rick uh, was at, was the running the base. It was Rick that said to them, I want Walter to be my radar. Orion. He needed his radar, just he like needed Potter and, and, and Blake because, did. Yeah, yeah, because they were off. The other the, the team was off doing their stuff. So he needed somebody to bounce things off. So he and I, I mean, they wrote it this way, but he and I developed like a comedic chemistry and it was great. I knew that he was the lead. He was the kingpin, but I could be... I could be as funny as I could be without sort of taking anything away from him. Right. So, you know, because my, my background was being in a, it was a, it was a comedian. So, um, so to your point, Nathan, I mean, if you look at, if you look probably from season five onwards, like how about halfway through, I think I got to do a lot more things that, um, that made it more interesting for me. So that when I was eventually back in the seat saying Chevron one encoding, <laughs> then um, then it was like it was OK, you know, yeah, it, was, it, it, it took you 10 seasons to finally get a shot of you going through the Stargate, you know, in 200. But it eventually did happen. Well, so. well, what you saw was me going up the ramp. You didn't see me going through the gate. Oh, they didn't draw you through. Oh. See, that's what everybody thinks, because it was like, come on, Walter, we're going. I didn't go through. 
That I almost feels like it was on purpose. <laughs> oh, I used to ask them. Like when I would get scripts that I was off world, yeah. I'd, go, I'd go, I'm off world. Yeah. Oh my God. I go, so I'm going through the puddle? No. What do you mean? Like, it's, it's inferred. It's like, it, it was totally like, I go, I go, uh, uh, well, how am I on this planet? They go, oh, you're just there. <laughs> I was like, so I'm not going through the puddle. I'm not actually, and they're like, no. And I go, why? And they go, well, it's too expensive. <laughs> so, so it was $5,000 a pass. So it wasn't worth, I was not worth it. Oh. They, but they would put me off world. They had me driving an owl cash. You know, like, like with a steering wheel. Um, <laughs> you flew Prometheus. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Flew, I yeah did all that stuff. With Don. And uh, and uh, but but to go through the puddle, yeah. And even when I was like flying that Alcash, um, I'd said to you know they put me in the seat and and I said to Andy Makita, Andy, how do I even know how to fly this? Like like, what, are you serious? Like I'm flying this? How do I know? And he goes, Oh, you just do. Yeah, you just do. It's like as if there was an owner's manual, like in the glove compartment of, you know, and that I just had to flip through. And These you know. characters had, were, were meant to have a life, lives of their own outside of what we saw on screen. And, you know, he's in one scene, you know, he's reading a friggin' magazine. He's reading, you know, Peter Delawise said, well, it's a technical manual, you know. He was studying this stuff. And you just got to go on and play it for all it's worth in the moment that it happened that well, as that, a fan that's how i infer that you know because obviously that, he was trained we just didn't see it right but the, but but you have to understand that 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 story about that me reading that magazine was because they were rehearsing that i told this story at, at, at countless yeah. conventions it's one of my favorites because they were we, i would always take a copy of vanity fair to this to to on set with me <laughs> and just like while they're rehearsing i'd just be reading vanity fair and uh, um, and and Peter had to uh, and and in this scene we're up in the upstairs on the big boardroom in Don's office and Ball you know mm-hmm. Peter Peter is on screen yeah like I'm gonna destroy the world in five minutes and there's all these Marines and and uh, and uh, scientists running around and techies and I remember saying to Peter when he's Peter goes this is what's gonna happen you know Ball's gonna come on he's gonna like you know the countdown to the end of the world. And you're all going to jump into action. And I go, oh, this is great. I get to do something. And I go to Peter, okay, what am I doing? He goes, ah, oh, you're just in your chair. I go, <laughs> what? I go, the world's going to end in five minutes. And everybody else has stuff to do. And I'm just in my chair. He goes, yeah, yeah, don't, don't worry about it. You're just like in your chair. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, okay, fine, fine, screw you. So I'm sitting there. And they rehearsed it a whole bunch of times because they had to block it. And uh-huh. all, where's everybody going, right? And I'm, and you know, in the back of your mind as an actor, you hear, okay, uh, uh, okay, uh, cut, reset, and that means everybody goes back to their first marks, and they and they rehearse it again. Well, I just got so engrossed in this in this Vanity Fair magazine that uh, I just hear, I just hear, uh, okay, cut, moving on, like they're going to the next scene. Next scene. And I'm like, what? Did they just shoot that? Like I didn't realize they'd rehearsed it so many times that I lost track of the fact that they'd actually shot it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm just sitting there browsing a movie. On camera. On camera. <laughs> and I have to go up to Peter while, while all the equipment's being carted Cleared. out of it. And I go, Peter, I'm sorry, you, you're gonna have to reshoot that scene. He's like, why? What do you mean? I said, Peter, oh my God, I feel so bad. But I was, oh God, I was reading a magazine while this was all happening. And he goes, oh yeah, no, I know that. I saw that. I go, what do you mean you saw it? What? And he goes, well, it just looked like you were reading the technical manual. And so it kind of <laughs> saved my ass a little bit, but then I went, okay, even if I was, why would I be reading a technical manual? Like ordering, ordering parts. 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 <laughs> <laughs> the world is about to blow up. It's like, Oh, I hope Amazon shows up with those nuts and bolts, for, you know, within the next three minutes. Oh, you know what I mean? It was like oh, moments, God. it was like moments like that and stories like that 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 are my favorite favorite moments from the show because they were all about like oh my God no and then everything turned out fine. They're winking know? at the audience. 
Oh yeah, you know absolutely. But Peter left it in. Peter of just course did he did. Reshoot it, and I'm just he just like falls like I will destroy the world, and I'm just like this, you know, flipping pages. Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> Scotty says, in season seven in Heroes, you get to describe your job to Saul Rubinick and the yeah. camera. Did that uh, need a few takes to not laugh? Tell us about that scene. It's it's one of the best scenes in, in it, the series. I know. It, it's actually, people ask me what's my favorite episode. That is my favorite episode. Heroes one and two. And yeah, because because Robert Cooper wrote that scene. Yeah. And, he, and it was like the ultimate piss take of... <laughs> my character he was taking the piss out of me because everybody else got interviewed for this for this uh archival video yeah. uh that Saul that Saul's character was uh was doing and when I read it I was like oh thank you god this is so funny like when I read it on my own I was like this is gonna kill like I know this is gonna kill and I played it like so sincerely yeah and nervous yeah. <laughs> nervous and I kept I, and and if you watch if you if you go back and watch it you see that I'm talking to Saul because I remember it like as if it was like five minutes ago Saul's here and the video camera's here and then the regular show camera yeah. is here like just off to the you know so I would be I would be talking to Saul then I'd be so but I'd sort of be glancing into the camera into the video camera like like uh, checking this thing out and just playing the nervousness of that. And yeah. Andy Nikita was, was standing behind Saul and he was biting his hand. <laughs> he was biting his hand and leaning over. And so imagine that I'm trying to deliver my lines and be sincere and nervous. And Andy Makita is just losing it. And I had to stay in character. So it would have been very easy for me to just start laughing. But Andy was like, oh my God. And it was just... Another thing, uh, what's it? Who's who asked that character? Uh, who asked that question? Uh, so that's Scotty. Scotty. So Scotty, if you go back and you watch that that moment where where I go, uh, yeah, you know, I say Chevron one, Chevron two, and uh, when oh, I get boy, to yep. Chevron, when I get to Chevron seven, I say uh, Chevron seven walk, just to shake things up a little bit. There's a techie. <laughs> there's a there's a black woman who's a techie over my shoulder, and I forget her name now which really bothers me. And but, someone else standing with her. There was, there was somebody. There was two leaning, of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was two of them. One of them is leaning over, but she's on this side of that person, right? So I'm here. I'm, I'm like here. And she's the next person to me. And she just kind of goes like this. And I say that line about like making, you know, shaking things up with Chevron saying why. And she just looks over and kind of goes. <laughs> she does this. She does this look. And I didn't know that she did that look. Of course, I didn't know that because I'm lo I'm looking at Saul, and when I see it play back, that killed me, because it was like it was like you suddenly saw this life with the techies and the size of his world, for better or for worse. Yeah, and you know? the fact that I'm thinking, yeah, I'm pretty hot shit that I'm uh, getting filmed here. Let me just tell you about my job. Yeah, and she's just looking at me, going. Oh, for the love of God. Are you yeah. Serious? And how sincere yep. he is, like, you know, it it really feels good to know that there's someone, you know, keeping the light on for him. Like Motel 6, you know, there's someone <laughs> on the other side just waiting for him. This, and he's just so big, sincere about it, you know, because so that would sincere. be his world. You yes. know, he's taking yeah. care of them. He's making sure yeah. that they get in and right. don't get splattered on the friggin' iris. And not <laughs> having any clue that he looks kind of lame. <laughs> You know what I mean? By just them looking over my, sh her looking over my shoulder, we laughed. Uh, and after that scene was over, she and I just killed ourselves laughing. But I didn't know that. And I, it was only when I saw the, the show and saw the footage that I saw her look. And I was like, that's just brilliant. Like Absolutely. She, actually, she actually included herself in the scene. And I yeah. love that. Couple more to throw at you before I let you go. Brain Shatterer, was it fun being Jerry O'Connell's jerk boss in the pilot episode of Sliders? Oh yeah, yeah, it was great. Anytime you get to play a jerk, it's fantastic. Cause you know, you have to find your inner jerk. Absolutely. And uh, you know, um, that, that was a fun show to, to work on. And I was just so disappointed. Like I was, uh, that was a show that I also, um, uh, got a recurring role on 
And because they were traveling, you know, going to different dimensions, mm -hmm. like Stargate. Very you know, similar. Very similar. Um, there were plans that I was going to be showing up in all these episodes um, as, a, as, you know, as me, but as different people. An altered you, yeah. An alter, uh, yeah, an alter ver alternate version of me. And they decided they wanted to, sh uh, I think it was one of some, they just wanted to shoot in L.A., you know, they just, they just wanted to move the production. When they came back for season two, this is interesting. They came back for season two. I what, I, how many seasons was it on? Was it two? Or Sliders, I've never watched it. I watched it oh, a little okay. in syndication. But all I know is, all I know is that, that I had to, it was the first show that I was a recurring character on that I had to re-audition for. Because <laughs> of the, yeah, I'm serious. I had, they, they got new producers. Uh, and the new producers were like, it was like, well, who's this guy? Yeah. This guy was hired by the previous load of producers. Yeah. And I thought I was a shoe in And they're like, well, no, you need to audition again. I was like, what? So I auditioned again. And I, and I was still on the show. But then shortly after that, the entire production moved to um, L.A. Moved to L.A. because they wanted to just be in a warmer climate. So, mm. But uh, it was fun. Jerry, Jerry O'Connell was a lovely guy. Yeah. Deadpool asks, do you speak Welsh? Uh, I don't, but I can say this. I can say the longest word in Welsh. That's one word? That's one word. And what and is that word? Well, it's one Welsh word, but it's, a, it's, the, it's the name of a place. It's like a train station. Okay. And it's 44 characters long. And like, if you go to that train station, it's like, it's like this humongous right. long train station uh, uh, name. And it means something like, you know, St. Mary's Church near the Dow, uh, okay. by the river, blah, blah. It's descriptive of where it is. And, um, and my mother taught me that. She would, ta she would say <laughs> that. And my brother, the, the last part of it where it goes, oh, go, go. My brother and I used to kill ourselves laughing just at the sound of it. And we always say to my mom, speak Welsh, speak Welsh again, say that word. And so we just learned it from her. Absolutely. Uh, I've always been able to say that word, but I can't actually speak the language. Last question from fans. Raj says, uh, when they when they ask you to return to Stargate for the, the new series that hopefully Brad uh, will come out with, will you say yeah. yes? And please say yes. Uh, yes, I'll say yes. Great. I'll say yes, but 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 I will. But I I'll need to keep the beard because I, I because I uh, I like the beard. It looks good, and uh, and I think it would like it, I think it would sort of give this idea of like uh, you know some time has passed kind of. Thing, it has, you know? yeah, and, and I think uh, that's his plan as well. And also, I mean, if he asked me, if Brad called me up and said, "Hey, we're doing it again, and do you want to be Walt? Do you want to come back as Walter?" I mean, like it would be a dream to have that happen to to reprise a role that where the when did the show end 2007 uh so, sg1 but yeah universe ended 2010 11 yeah right but i mean I was it's been a long the, time it's yeah. been a long time and i i obviously connect myself to i'm more connected to sg1 even though there were crossovers and yeah little, little scenes here and there he was at the but, pentagon when we last saw him is my point yeah so yeah and with yeah. rick of course Right so. in new camo, new camo outfits. And I need to, I need to um, clarify. I, I, I said Brad's intent is to have it, you know, be now. I don't know that for a fact, but I mean, it, it makes. I, I don't at all, but it makes sense. So, Gary. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if it meant that I that I got reprised, that that Walter came back and you know came out of retirement or whatever. I mean, I would. It would be a dream come true. I would, I would do it in a heartbeat. Of course, you know. Awesome. So, yeah. This has been a pleasure, sir. Oh, and totally thank you for that. showing off your art before we let you go. Um, I wanted to, uh, with you, let everyone know that I called Gary a few weeks ago. And uh, we, along with Jenny Steven, had been hoping to do some kind of a fan project where we took fans aside and asked them about the show and what it meant to them and the impact that it's had on them and what they liked and didn't like about it. And it never fully materialized. Well, I, I called Gary and I said, would you like to do something like that for this show? It's kind of like a, a sub-series of episodes, especially you know with, with the capabilities that we have now with Zoom and yeah. being able to reach people around the world that way. Mm -hmm. And you said yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I put out Again, a request. in a heartbeat. 
Thank you. I put out a request uh, on social media to fans who have had Stargate impact their lives in some way to reach mm -hmm. out to us. And and um, Gary's going to interview and tell yep. their story. So we've got six or seven now. If you think that you have a unique Stargate story, like if it's if it's uh, brought you some comfort in your life or you became an Egyptologist or a scientist or a mathematician because of Stargate or, or some kind of- Or the Air Force. Join the Air Force, yes, yes. We don't have that any of those a, that, yet. That was a big one. Like I, I've, I've met people at conventions who joined the Air Force because they just loved what Stargate, how Stargate presented it. It's exactly. Cool. We haven't decided on a time uh, where we're all going to get together with Gary to shoot a few of these. They'll be pre-recorded. -re pre but mm -hmm. if you want to be included in that, email me right away at dialthegateshow at gmail.com. And the link will be later. Gary? Well, I just want to say, I, too, to that. Yes, and please. I that, please. That, I've, that we've done something like this. Like, we tried a little iteration of this earlier at one point just to see how that would look. And I loved it. It was a way for me to get really in depth with fans because, you know, when I'm at conventions and fans come and talk to me at my table, there's only, you know, I try to give them as much time as I can, but there's only so much time I can talk to them to find out about their lives. But, it, but to be actually able to interview and talk to people about their lives, I, I just, I love that because I find out, I just love finding out about the Stargate fans. So this is going to be a complete, absolute treat for me to, to be able to do this and work with work with the majestic David Reed. So there you go. I'm into it. It's, it's, I look forward to seeing everybody. I can't wait. And um, yeah, we we're, I'd like to shoot um, in the next uh, few weeks here and start rolling out some episodes. Uh, yeah, definitely absolutely. by late November, early December. So you bet. I'll be in Come touch around. with you about that, buddy. My friend, this has been a treat for me as well. Yeah. And uh, it's so oh, I can tell because you put a tie on. You know, I, I, I thank you guys for for taking tell the me that's time. Not a clip on. That's not a clip on, is it? Oh, David, thank you. All right. <laughs> Joseph Malazzi said the same thing. Is that a clip on? Show it. So, Jonesy, thank you, my friend. You're welcome, David. I'll we'll be in touch to with you really soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me, Mr. Gary Bye -bye. Jones. Everyone, thank you, sir, Mr. Gary Jones. Um, I can't say enough good things about that guy. He uh, has been a treat. He has always been there for me uh, on the various Stargate projects that I've been involved in uh, over the years, you know, with coming out of and saying, hey, you want to do this? You want to do that? Tell me where and when. He's always been that way. And he continues to be a, 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 a good guy, a good friend. So. I'm, I'm delighted that he's uh, with us for the first few rounds of uh, these uh, uh, Dial the Gate interviews and that he's going to be launching the, the fan show with you. So it's time for you guys to get on the show and uh, be a part of this next phase. Before I let you guys go, if I can get my act together here. There it is. If you like what you've seen in this episode, I would appreciate if you click the like icon makes a great difference with YouTube's al algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. If you plan to watch live, I recommend giving the bell icon a click so you'll be the first to know of any schedule changes, which will probably happen all the time. And bear in mind, clips from this live stream will hopefully be released over the course of the next several days on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. I was planning on pumping out a couple of these you know, every weekday. I just haven't had the time. That's been really frustrating. But Darren at GateWorld has been really good about taking a lot of the bigger... Uh, pieces and sharing them with his audience, which has then turned around and uh, got more people back. I apologize for not being able to get to uh, everyone's questions. We'll have Gary back in another interview at some point in the future, but uh, in the meantime, he's going to sit down with a bunch of you. And uh, if you think you have an interesting story to tell, I'm particularly looking for people who you know got into careers because of Stargate. We've got a few already in mind that we want in terms of um, people who have had like uh, injuries and illnesses and personal uh, life stories of that respect. But I haven't uh, seen really anyone come across my desk yet who entered the Air Force or the military. Um, so if you're out there and would like to tell that story in, in relation to how Stargate changed your life, uh, please email me, dialthegateshow at gmail.com. Mr. Tom McBeth will be joining us in about uh, 25 minutes right here on Dial the Gate. Uh, and 
stick around for that because it's Harry Mayborn and Tom is a treat. I'm David Reed. See you on the other side.